Welcome to the Red Dice Diaries. This podcast is a rambling journey through the wonderful world of RPGs from the viewpoint of a long-time GM and player. The music at the start of this podcast was Nightmare by Alexander Nakarada and is used under Creative Commons license. Let's just, oh, let's just, power, let's just power through and get it done, Lloyd. Commi- okay, commitment. Okay. Oh, okay. Right, week, week three, describe, question 13, describe how your play has evolved. Hear me up, Lloyd. Break it down for me. My games no long, uh, have always been fantastic stories about doing cool things with cool people at cool places. Location, location, location. Cool bad guys. Situations and circumstances. I like, I like high adventure. I like having to fight the bad guy on the roof while it's raining and like people are shooting at you. I love trying to, what's called, like having a like sword fight on a flying airship. I love cool things like that. I love like high adventure things. But over the years, I've also come to enjoy a personal stake. I've enjoyed pulling in people's backstories into games and molding the game around that. I've enjoyed watching people like lose their mind as I bring an NPC that they wrote up like two weeks ago. They didn't think, oh, Lloyd isn't going to bring this villain in. I'm like, surprise, that villain is here, and he's here to fuck you up. And I like that. That's kind of, I, I really enjoy that specifically. I like telling and bring those backgrounds in, which has been the thing that's changed for me the most. How about yourself, Johannes? Uh, basically, more improvisation based on what happens in the game and what the characters are trying to do. Uh, I used to prep uh, quite a lot and fairly detailed uh, as well uh, when it comes to prep, but um, uh, nowadays it's it's more I'll have maybe a couple of locations just like typed out like abandoned warehouse and then maybe like uh, rusted chains hanging from the roof. It's just sort of like imagery uh, written for myself and um, then a, a bunch of names if I need new names and uh, maybe if I'm aware of sort of like what the characters have planned uh, going forward maybe I'll have uh, a list of things that come to my mind based on that and as like before I used to have a lot of stats uh fairly lengthy uh, notes written out for then this happens, then this happens. And I think we, a lot of us did that in, in, the, in the beginning of our careers. Mm-hmm. But basically, uh, nowadays, I, I've, I've very much grown towards improv based on what the characters are, what their connections to this game and the setting are, and what they want to do. Um, I try to springboard of those uh, on the spot, basically. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think over the years, my sort of play style, certainly my jamming style, has evolved to to the point where most of my games are basically like, oh, here's like a world. There's this sort of stuff, this craziness going on in the background. Then it's a group of people thrown into that setting, whatever it is, with their own sort of foibles. And just them like doing their thing and coming across like stuff that's going on. Maybe they've they've not been directly involved in it, but having like stuff seemingly that's going on in the background, even if they're not directly doing anything towards it, again makes the world seem like a bigger place. Okay, right, let's hit up question fourteen. Describe a failure that became Well, Lloyd uh, Hammond, because he doesn't fail. Yeah, I know that's for my role, so I don't know, guys. Uh, Johannes, you take this one while I think about this one. It's actually quite difficult for me. I'm going to think of a good failure. Well, so I, oh, I, I, oh, I was going to oh. say, I, I've definitely got one. Go on, then. And I apologise if it's the one you're about to suggest, Lloyd, but it's that bit with the um, the Sorcerer King in your game and the baths. Oh, God damn it! That's what I was going to do! Go on, then. Do it. No, no, I'll I tell you what. You run the game, no, so no, you... No, 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 you, no, 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 I'm better just... off on your end than it is from my end, so you go for it. Uh, okay, okay, right. So, so to, to paint the scene, we were playing a, a 2D20 Conan game uh, that Lloyd's running. We're trying to track down a sorcerer king. I'm playing a, a female Sumerian archer. 
we we've we found out this sorcerer king's kidnapped princess dynamide because he wants to like get married to her thank fuck somebody did and um we, we're sort of infiltrating like his palace we're like all right we need to like find out what's going on what the wedding arrangements are so we can like infiltrate it dan makes a role to see what he knows about these uh these stygian sort of wedding ceremonies fails his role and he goes all right i know that uh I know that the group, so the the bride, purifies herself by like bathing in the baths with just a few personal attendants before the ceremony, and we're like, oh great, quality. What I'll do is I'll like disrobe, I'll pretend to be another like person in the baths, slip up next to her and go, oh princess, we're here to get you out, and we'll escape over the rooftops. Bit of a fight, everyone's a winner. Happy days. Well, when I go in there, leaving like the other player characters outside. It soon becomes obvious that he's made a mistake, and it's the groom that purifies himself in the bath. And instead of like seeing the princess and like commencing daring escape plan number one, it's actually this like evil ass sorcerer king sat naked in the baths. So I'm like, right, okay, you've got to try and style it out. So I just sort of come in there and like pretend that I'm like effectively a groupie who is like, oh no, this princess, she, oh, she's not good enough for you. You need like a real Sumerian woman, and sort of laying it on fairly thick. It eventually he sort of like rumbles that that's not what I'm there for at which point I use the sort of intimidation like stare down attacks to sort of like stun him allow me to get to the door at which point he recovers lays some like magical spells down on me to like lay me low and I've sort of like crawled to the door and I'm like oh, nearly made it to freedom at which point Whitey's character is like this old grizzled ass white mercenary outside is like Oh, it sounds like there's some bad shit going on now. So it kicks the door open and also stares down the Sorcerer King as well and like hauls me out of the baths. Loved it. That was actually <laughs> I remember that. That was. I recorded that. I need to go back and watch that again. That was good. Good times. Good morning, Hannes. Uh, two came to mind. Uh, one which was uh, a character of mine and one in a game that I ran. Uh, which one do you guys want? Or do you want them both? <laughs> yeah, just hit us up, man. Let's go, boy! Wow! So, uh, the game that I ran, uh, Burning Wheel, uh, we had a character who was essentially like the, the heir uh, to the throne, uh, except that the royal family had been dethroned. So, they were in exile. And when we finally got back to the capital to start a revolution, like rile up popular support, for this heir of the crown, uh, they went to sleep in a CD uh, tower, or like uh, in uh, slash flop house, and uh, one of them rolled very badly in in a roll where they tried to get some friends. Uh, basically, everyone else was asleep, and they were trying to the heir to the crown was trying to uh, fly, like get a specific mercenary friend uh, to do some stuff with. And they failed, uh, which uh, then translated into the mercenary that they were trying to find and do stuff with. Uh, they were like drunk off their ass uh, with a, a loaded crossbow in, in their hands while, while they were like bumbling around the tavern uh, and accidentally shot the um, the heir to the, the crown. <laughs> and uh, in, in Burning Wheel, you, you sort of randomize the how, because you can't control the bolt exactly. So you randomize the sort of like how dangerous was this shot. And it went all the way up to the max, basically like instant death. So basically, like this, uh, this drunk ass mercenary accidentally shot his friend, the heir to the crown, straight to the heart with a crossbow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the heir to the crown uh, falls down in Burning Wheel. Uh, you can survive if you have a thing. Uh, if you have a resource, you can survive a situation like that, but you will be laid out for like months on end, basically in critical condition. And so the heir to the crown had one of those resources. So they just fall down, and well, the plan goes to shit. Like, we can't very well, like, our. Our figurehead is is almost dead now, so we we get up uh, a couple of different uh, religion representatives, so a couple of different priests. They try to like heal this this person, this this heir to the crown, 
because uh, they're trying to obviously like think, oh, once I heal this this royalty and they take over this city again, this empire, uh, my religion will be receiving a lot of boons from the crown and whatever. Okay, so these different priests come up uh, and they try to resurrect the heir and basically just kill themselves in the process because they failed so spectacularly. So this is like a chain of spectacular failures here. <laughs> so these priests try to call up uh, the divine powers and they basically annihilate themselves in the attempt. Nice. And uh, eventually uh, it culminates into a couple of uh, manifestations of, of deities uh, unexpectedly like just stepping down into the capital city. One of them which just rises up uh, this uh, heir to the crown and says you're my representative on <laughs> on earth have a good day and what follows was um, uh, the campaign sort of ended around that time but uh, we are probably going to start so at, at another one at a later time but uh, like decades of religious upheaval started afterwards because like now people have actual evidence like we have seen gods walk around in the city raising up the dead so everyone went uh, religion crazy in the town and that all started because one drunk mercenary accidentally like shot uh, the, the air <laughs> so that was a fun time and then uh, for my own character uh, the uh, the now infamous Edwin Locke uh, in John <laughs> Lamentations game, uh, a very hard-ass uh, fighter equipped with the best shit, uh, the best stats. He was supposed to be unkillable. John rolls three crits in a row in the second session of the game, and a zombie eats his face. And uh, that, <laughs> <laughs> that, that was an amazing chain of events, uh, because it has resulted in one of the other characters sort of building up this, like, completely like false uh, and deceitful mythology around this this Edwin Locke character and now he's sort of like Saint Locke. I was gonna say I have heard that Dennis has been like pitching for like a GURPS Edwin Locke supplement so <laughs> yeah I'm surprised Dennis so how about yourself yeah. then Lloyd to make it short there was a to make sure like games happening they had, they had to rescue like the prince the prince is being held by a badass guy who's dying on a bridge of a volcano. They go on the bridge, stop fighting the bad guy. They find the bad guy, they come in, they make a critical, the guy who's lead, the leader guy is fighting, right? And then the guy's next to him, they jump in to help, but he rolls critical fail. So he starts to fall the volcano. Then the guy next to him goes, I'll catch him, rolls, critical fail. He catches him, and he starts to the volcano. Then the next guy, rolls, critical fail. Third person, now falling, go it. Finally, the fighter goes, I roll, plus success. And I have this lovely moment where the fighter is hanging onto the bridge with three people dangling beneath him on his other hand. And he's desperately holding on with one hand. And the main villain's like, it's time to die. And all four of them are like, oh shit! It's of course at this point that one of the character members that they have like a, um, they have like a, a suggestion move that they can like suggest something to someone and they'll do one action. They picked it up earlier because they're playing Dungeon World. You got like a power to do one suggestion. And he goes, I've got it! I look at the main one and go, jump! So the main one looks down, then he leaps, like, right over the guy, and he falls in the volcano. And I end the game with the prince coming up going, thank you very much! And him going, um, I can't lift you guys up. And the four of them dangling off this bridge at the very edge of the volcano. Nice. One of my favorite failures. Because I, I never got three critical failures in one row before, and I was like, I'm going to make it look good. And that, that, that was my favorite. I, I'll kick it. Yeah, love it. Okay. I think we can jump on to question 15, uh, which is a describe a tricky RPG experience that you enjoyed. I'm not quite sure what it means by a tricky RPG uh, experience. I think it means something that may have made you slightly uncomfortable, but after you went back and thought about it, you realized it was alright. Like, a moment where someone says something and you're like, I'm not sure about this. I don't know where this is going. But then as you play through, you're like, okay, actually it wasn't as bad as I thought. I don't know, I think if it sounds as if you'd like. Oh, well, well if you'd enjoyed with a few months, I have just remembered another failure that was amazing as far as I'm concerned. Go that, on! That, that just made me laugh. Um, it was in the, the Lamentations game I'm running that Johannes is playing in. And we've basically got um, 
uh, a character, William, who's played by Johannes Einloft, who is like Dungeoneer Supreme. He's like prepped to the max. He's got your rope, your 10 foot poles, you like everything you need to be in a dungeon. Then we've got the other characters who are. I think it's fair to say Johannes are a bit more sort of laissez-faire when it comes to the whole like dungeon prep. We, they're exploring this dungeon. I'm like, oh, okay, you get to this, uh, you get to this sort of like sheer drop. It's about 50 feet down. Johannes Einloft, William is like, no problems. Busts out the 50 foot rope, whoo, ties it off. Down they go. They carry on. Oh, there's another drop again, about 50 feet. He's like, all right, okay, one of you guys get out your rope and we'll go down. And they're all like, um, <laughs> what rope? <laughs> Yeah, uh, about about that rope that we've not got, and and just seeing him like in character, being like, seriously, we we came into a fucking dungeon, and I'm like the only guy who bought rope, and you guys like bought any equipment for this dungeon, and I was just sat there like with a mic muted, like laughing my ass off <laughs> as he's like full ball like in character like tearing strips off and be like what kind of like <laughs> shitty ass dungeon explorers are you that you've not even got rope or 10 foot poles i've got like caltrops 10 foot poles rope the lot so yeah that made me laugh but in terms in terms of a a tricky rpg experience i can't really think of too many tricky experiences um i think the nearest would have been for me was um do you remember that um flash gordon one shot i ran of fate that you played in lloyd Good time. That was my first fake game, wasn't it? it, it if it wasn't the first, it was one of the first. But um, we, we had, we had a, a player in it who was sort of like fairly sort of bombastic and was like fairly sort of like, not, not in a bad way, but you know, sort of like quite loud and quite sort of like in your face as it were. And originally I sort of thought, oh, you know, is that going to cause problems? But I think because it was like a sort of flash gourd and like sort of, no one's taking it too seriously. It's all sort of like four colour heroics. It was, it was absolutely fine, and I really enjoyed the game. But certainly at the start, I was like, "Oh, is is this guy like going to work with the other people in the group?" But yeah, it turned out right in the end. Thanks, so, right? I I'm thinking of one that I can say without being offensive. Because I've had a lot of tricky moments where I'm like, I'm uncomfortable with the way things are going, but it's turned out all right. And I was like, I'm glad I stuck through it. If there's any one that I think would probably make me a bit more tricky, it would have, I played a penny for my thoughts game once, which is a game where you play people in the psychiatric ward who are slowly getting your memories back from what people say. And as, and the game is the game is very intense if you're not careful. It's not the most intense game I play, but it's right up there for me. And I don't, I don't do intense very well. Because as the plot line came, went on and on, it turned out that I actually poisoned an entire town. I, I was trying to get create this, like, cool, I was trying to, I was doing the poisonous handbook plot line where I had a wife, she was lovely, but she fell in love with someone else, and I got really mad, and I blamed the whole town for it. So I started poisoning the water supply, and it just got worse and worse and worse. And I was like, I am uncomfortable the way things are going, but I'm gonna play it through. And by the end, I was like, that was actually incredible. I, it was, I embodied the character and I went in for it. And by the end of the game, when I realized my, mem my, I realized my memories, I chose to forget everything again because I'd chosen to forget things before. I'd, in, I'd intentionally lost my memories and I chose to do it again because I refused to let myself believe that I was the bad guy. And I was like, actually, that was, that was a really fun storytelling experience. And uh, I think that's a close thing I have to a tricky RPG experience I enjoyed. How about yourself then, Johannes? <laughs> I still don't quite know what exactly tricky is meant to mean. I guess I could look it up on uh, the Casting Shadows blog, like it says on the, the thing there. But, casting um, Shadows. Yes. Casting Shadows. Roots. Well, we can always skip it for you if you want. You don't have to worry about it. No. Uh, well, mm, there's certainly been uh, moments don't, 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 maybe bring, don't maybe bring up the gun bros, man. No, no, it, this, this is before the gun bros, which is a, a recent event in uh, Vampire Game Arrow, which the, the less said, the better. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> the, uh, there were several times uh, in... Well, this, is, this is me as a player in Vampire. Um, I... Well, when we started the game, uh, after a couple of weeks after uh, my character died and became a vampire, uh, there was an opportunity to go back home 
So this is in the, the Dark Ages. So um, a character goes back home. There's this, this uh, wife-to-be that I brought into his background. So it, it, it was a person that he was like building up the, the dowry for and everything to, to get married eventually. And um, basically go back home, uh, pretend that nothing's wrong, and basically kidnap this person take him take them away and be like uh it, it, like in in his romantic mind my character's romantic mind it was all about like okay so now we're gonna live forever right and it's gonna be cool and what uh, and obviously like that night uh, there was an, an, an embrace and the wife became a vampire as well and what resulted was like 600 years of this on and off really grueling uh like facing up to the realities of, of trying to mimic being in an actual healthy relationship uh, where both of the people in the, in the relationship are vampires and uh, completely inhumane. And uh, we, like, there were moments where like, okay, uh, it's been a couple of hundred years now and the relationship is in a, is in a difficult place cause there's sort of a desire to have offspring, but that's off the table now. So it goes into disturbing territories when you start looking for alternatives. <laughs> to, like, yeah. Uh, how how do you have offspring? That's not just okay. Let's take Joe Schmo off the street and make him a vampire. Uh, so there there were definitely some uh, fairly intense uh, topics like how do you have babies when you're a vampire? You don't. Spoilers. You don't. But you get up to some <laughs> disturbing shit. I just want to pop a baby, y'all. Oh, shoot. You, you make some uh, ridiculous homunculus <laughs> type horrors that then you nurse. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, Vampire is, is, is a game where uh, that has happened to me the most when uh, you get into territories where you're like, this is some. Oof. Oof. Well, uh, for the most part, I think it's you know, like afterwards. When you when you think back, it's been it's been good, and no one has been hurt because uh, you have to be careful about that sort of thing, especially in a game like Vampire, because you get to you get up to some disturbing shit every now and then. But mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, okay, so next question, question sixteen: What are your plans for your next game? And I'm assuming Lloyd, for you, one of your plans is going to be sort of getting your ass in gear and running me some John Carter at some point. Uh, well, I would, but you hate John Carter. I'm like, I'm ready for John Carter, baby. The game's coming out soon. We're going to get together. Lloyd, I, I, Lloyd as I've said several times, I'm not the biggest fan of the 2D20 system. But w when have you ever run a 2D20 game where I've been like, no, I'm not going to play it because it's 2D20? That's a good point. You're right. Okay, my next plan would be to run you a John Carter game. That's my plan. Splendid. That's my I, I'm, I'm, I'm still waiting for my... I can't wait to get my printed copy. Looking forward to that. Mm-mm-mm. So I've been um, I've been listening to the audio books for John Carter, so I'm I'm ready for that. Jesus, I'm I'm ready for some act. I've listened to the first two through, man. Watch the film as well. Uh, my body's my, really good. My body's oh, I love the film, man. I loved it. So good. Okay, so aside from John Carter, what are your plans for your next game? I don't have any plans. I have no game plans so far. I'm actually on a game. A game. I just keep on. I just keep on games on demand from Gen Con. I'm like I'm chilled. I'm just relax. I'm not planning anything yet. In the future, I will look into it. But right now, I'm just me. Cool. So, um, what about yourself, Johannes? I know you recently we've been talking about we're sort of getting into like the final stages of the V20 game mm -hmm. you're running. Have you any thoughts for like what game you're potentially going to run after that, or what you're going to run yeah. for other groups? Yeah, um, I've had Stars Without Number, the uh, the uh, the revised edition, uh, on, on the back of my mind, uh, like a virus, uh, for a long while now. So that's probably on the table at least. It's, it's uh, honestly, it's going to be Stars Without Number, Sweet. revised edition, or Swihander, one of the two. Which oh, I, I tell you what, I don't, don't know if I've pointed this out to you before, but if you're looking at Stars Without Number, there's a website called Sectors Without Number. Oh yes. And that is, just, as I'm sure you probably know, generates like a random sort of sector with all the planets and various. Absolutely stunning. I'd love to run run or play something like that myself. Um, yeah. uh, Stars Without Number is 
uh, both like the the original edition, uh, amazing game, amazing like OSR based, but like evolved uh, towards a like a direction of his own, somewhat at least. Uh, OSR based um, sci-fi game, which like the, the sort of like basic premise. You can do a variety of stuff with it, but the basic premise is your freebooting mercenaries or like rapscallions of the galaxy and you're going about with your ship doing jobs, getting credits and maybe getting murdered in the process. But um, yeah, there's there's a lot you can do with it, especially with the, the revised edition because there's more uh, more content with it. You, <laughs> there's actually like space magic in it. So if you want to have your like 70s flavored sort of like psychedelic space wizards shit and uh, there's like Jedi stuff like uh, the serial numbers have been filed thoroughly but yeah so that's that's on the mind and obviously it's why hander as well uh, as you mentioned before uh, I too have the the giant uh, man slaying book mm -hmm. and I enjoy it quite a bit yeah I mean I, I think I think for myself obviously as you know um, I, I want to run some BX essentials at some point uh, and that is just me trying to like progressively run like more sort of traditional like, OSR sort of games to yeah. see like how how sort of like traditionally like old school I can get it and still have a game that I enjoy as a GM and that my players still enjoy. I'd also like to have a go at running Adventures in Middle Earth, the um, the five E version of like um, mm -hmm. One Ring because I've got like the Player's Guide and the Law Master's Guide to that and. I think there's some interesting sort of tweaks on the fifth edition system in that, but um, I'd like to get back to running some Fate as well, um, maybe some Dresden Accelerator. I've done a few one shots of that. Um, I've, I've got loads of different stuff I'd quite like to run. I think it just, and I've always got loads of ideas. I think it just depends when you get to that juncture where you're like, right, I've got time to run another game that like I've just wrapped up a campaign or whatever and I've had a bit of a breather it tends to be which of those ideas are sort of bubbling to the surface when I get to that point mm -hmm. actually Dark I just realised oh yeah and Vampire the Dark Ages <laughs> more like Vampire the Boar Ages uh, I just realised I had a I have a game I picked up at Gen Con I'm looking to run called Axion Axon Punk Overdrive by the Wrong Brothers it was written by this really super energetic guy and he, I look, look at this it. basically it's Cyberpunk combined with hip hop, and I'm like, it's, a, it's, it's a combo we've all been waiting for. Let's face it. I mean, like hip hop side. I mean, hey, 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 Luke Cage. Luke Cage is there, baby. I'm just saying, I can make the cyberpunk version of Luke Cage right now. It's right here waiting for me. Sweet Christmas. Okay, so on to questions. Uh, and to be honest, I, I would quietly play in a game of that. So I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> as, soon as, as soon as you're like, oh, you can make. Oh, yeah, all you'd have to say is, like, oh, you can make a version of Luke Cage in this game. And I'd be like, sold. Sold. But uh, all right, let's move on to question 17. Describe the best compliment you've had while gaming. And I'll. I'll quite happily hit this one up. For me, the the best compliment is whenever you're like talking about games and someone either says, like, oh, hey, do you remember this when this happened in that one game you ran? Or this was cool when it happened in that one game you ran? Or do you remember when your character did this? Especially if it's a game that like happened ages ago and someone's like, oh, do you remember when this happened? And it's the fact that with everything going on in like people's like real lives and all the many and various like hundreds of different games we play if something in a game has been sort of worthwhile enough to like stick in a person's mind i always think that's a great compliment if there's one compliment my ego really could not handle because i was like oh my god i can't believe someone said this someone once said meeting me after after seeing me run a game online was like they were starstruck and I, I'm like I, I can't I can't I, I can't accept that phrase to the phrase because I am not L a Lloyd. I only said it. I only said it the once. Okay. <laughs> but like I, I I spent like the rest of the day just basically on a on a in, uh, like as a person I really um, I give I have mad props to. You. Literally it was like yeah Lloyd meaning it was just made me starstruck and I'm like I'm 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 done I'm out that's it nothing will be better than this. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that has been one of the great things about online gaming and sort of going to a few more cons like 
UK Games Expo is like actually so obviously I love the online gaming don't get me wrong and due to like the fact we all live in various different places well, we couldn't do like regular face to face games but be, being able to on like occasions meet the people you've gamed with online and actually sort of like interact with them as people I, I think that's a really great thing and it's, it's certainly one of the main draws of like conventions along with like getting to game with new people for me yeah how about yourself, Johannes? Well, hopefully the answer is going to be just every compliment ever, because I'm Finnish, and most of our compliments it, like boil down to, it's not bad. So whenever someone says, that was good, I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh dear sir, I'm Mr. Darcy. <laughs> I think this game was better than average. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, uh, not really used to handling compliments, so that, that's that's my answer. I, I Every compliment I get is always somewhat of a surprise to me, like, oh, well, really? You, you, you think that? I, I do think, I mean, I think you raise an important point there. It, it is a, a good thing to, like, compliment someone if they run a good game. Because so I think if someone like, runs a shit game, most people would be like, nah, that game was trash. So I think on, on the sort of opposite side, and it's certainly something I try and do, like if someone's run a good game, even if it's just like firing them a Facebook message afterwards saying like, oh, thanks for running the game last night, dude, I like, really enjoyed it. I, I think it's as much my responsibility as a player to sort of like give that positive feedback as it is to give like the negative or like constructive feedback if I've not enjoyed something. Yeah. Positive reinforcement goes a long way with people. Uh, and for myself, I don't remember to do it nearly enough. But yeah, compliment well, your GMs and your fellow players as well, listeners. Yes, well, well, that's it. I mean, I think one of my sort of like favorite compliments I have is that when I get to the end of the game, I always like to, like, when I finish recording or whatever, I always like to say to people, you know, like, oh, thanks for playing. I've really enjoyed running it. Hope you enjoyed playing in the game. And if everyone says, yeah, we had a great time, we had a good time, we enjoyed playing in it, then that, that, that's the best compliment as far as I'm concerned when someone says, yeah, we've enjoyed that session. That, that's what I'm aiming for. Okay, so if no one else has anything on question 17, let's go on to question 18. Describe what art inspires your games. I mean, I, sorry, go ahead, Lloyd. I don't know about this. I'd like to say I have an art specific that inspires my games, but the truth is, it's more, I mean, oh, hold on, wait. Technically, movies are art, right? Yeah. Because movies are what's about my game. If I watch a movie, like, I watch a movie and something cool happens in it, that's going to be my game next week. I love a good action movie or a good, like, comedy or something like that or, like, some kind of, any kind of, any kind of movie-based uh, art form I use for my game. So, yeah, I'd say the art that inspires my games are basically movies. I, I mean, I, th I think for myself, I mean, I'm... Um... I'm so I use Pinterest a lot, and I'm also yeah. subscribed to like a number of communities on Google Plus and a couple of like things on Facebook that post like um, pictures from like, amateur artists and stuff like that. And it would just be like random sort of atmospheric pictures. And quite often I'll see one of them, and like let's say it's like a a dark and like brooding like crumbling down stone tower on a hill I might be like oh yeah they, yeah, I could use that in a game or it's just things that spark off like random ideas so it's not like a specific artist it's just when you sort of see something and it sort of like touches something in your mind that makes that sets you off on a train of thought that makes you think oh yeah I could do this in my game or I could do that in my game or yeah I could put like a crumbling tower in my game with like a, a dark sky behind it that's the sort of thing that inspires my games it's atmospheric stuff yeah, much the same for me. I tend to sort of get lost into Pinterest and DeviantArt. I'll, I'll just be like, oh, this uh, like vampire game is coming up on Sunday, and I, I still need a picture for that one NPC. And four hours later, I'm like, well, I've saved uh, like 5,000 pictures now. And I still don't have a picture. I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm exactly the same, man. I'll, I'll go on and I'll be like, oh, I want to find a picture of a paladin. And then, like, four hours later, like, blurrily eyed, I'm staring at the computer, like, with, like, say, like, hundreds of pictures that have, like, scrolled. they being like, oh, just have a look at a couple more before I sleep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, 
But uh, yeah, Pinterest is uh, a way for me to get access to art. And uh, like I said, DeviantArt as well. And ArtStation. ArtStation is full of glorious concept art for video games, movies, uh, book cover art, uh, 3D design, all kinds of good stuff. I, I mean, I think as well, if you take it down to like brass tacks, just like going on like Google image search and mm-hmm. typing shit in, it's like, if you're running a fantasy game you and you're looking for like an NPC picture, as I'm like often doing, you can go into Google image search and type in like D&D tavern keeper or D D like mm-hmm. assassin or like fantasy knight or whatever and you will get like hundreds of pictures and there's bound to be at least one in that sort of torrent of images that's going to spark off something in your imagination mm-hmm. okay so i think we can roll on to question 19 which is what music enhances your game lo-fi chill hop on youtube it is a 24-hour stream of low chill music, and there's a girl trying to do her homework. She will never finish that homework. And that's what I have playing in the background whenever I am writing a plot. I, I think for myself, um, it depends on the game. I tend to go for like music that's more appropriate for the game. Uh, the most recent example is in um, Johannes's V20 session he ran, where we went into like a nightclub. And he like linked us to a YouTube video, which was like the blood rave out of um, yeah, blade, uh, blade, and like literally as soon as that sort of like thumping like club music came on, like a bit of a sort of metal undertones in the background, I was like, right, that tells me everything I need to know about this scene. <laughs> I've seen Blade. I know what sort of club it is. I know what sort of clientele it is. Right, let's go. And it like, obviously Johannes went on to describe the place and like the people who were there. But even before he got to that description, I was just like yeah that music just told me so much about that scene which i think really did like enhance it for me because it wasn't just me going like all right okay so johanna she's telling me this she's telling me that it was me sort of starting off going yeah i've already got the idea that anything you're adding on is just like extra like flavor on top of that mm-hmm. uh music is a, is a tricky beast uh, in in-person games, I tend to have uh, either uh, like game soundtracks on for the entire session, or uh, other types of atmospheric stuff, uh, dark ambient, uh, a lot of good dark ambient stuff, uh, freely available on the internet as well. Look at uh, Bandcamp if you're interested in that sort of thing. Cryo Chamber. Um, I tend to get inspired by music a lot. So, and what I mean by that is, uh, either like on the character level or the scene level, or just like in a vague sense, like the thematic level of uh, either a session or a campaign. So, I could be listening to um, like one of my favorites uh, from some black metal band that I like. Like, yeah. I, I really like this song, and there's this particular piece of the lyrics or this particular riff that conj- conjures up these images, and then uh, I might uh, try and sort of base a session around what came to my mind from listening to a song. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, one of the advantages of YouTube, and I, I sort of listen to it a fair bit myself, is rather like we said about Pinterest when you browse through for pictures. Mm-hmm. Because often, like when you play some music that you like, you'll get like here's some similar videos, some of which you won't like, some of which won't be applicable. But I quite like sort of clicking on a few of these, and I'll be like, oh yeah, that sounds quite cool, and I just like, add it to a playlist. So I've just got like a big playlist that's like constantly changing. So that if I'm writing, I'll have that like playing in the background. Then occasionally, mm-hmm. I'll just look up and go, oh, what's it suggesting? And I'll try one of them. And as well as sort of expanding the music that I listen to, as well as reminding me of some like oldies I've not listened to for a while it also like you say it helps bring those different moods and like different sort of vibes to a game as well mm-hmm. you got, got anything else to add on music lloyd no i think you guys have pretty much covered that whole thing on board i i don't tend to play music in my game because i don't like getting distracted or i'm very loud but every now and then i'll put something in to make it atmospheric but i very rarely do that i have friends who do nothing but music or their games but for me it's it's a distraction more than an actual effect 
And also, I, I sometimes might put one in to like enhance the effect of a scene, but then the music is gone, and I'm like, well, I, I could have done without it. Yeah. So that's it for this episode. If you have any questions or suggestions for things you'd like to see in the podcast in future, please either email them to reddicediaries at gmail.com or drop me a voicemail at Anchor. Until I see you next time, whenever you're playing, take care and enjoy yourselves. Thank you.